Section 7, Summary and Next Steps. In this section, we'll review what we've learned, look at some next steps to continue improving your CUDA skills, and present some resources that you can use for further study. What we have learned. In this video, we'll briefly review all the topics we covered in this course. We started with an overview of the CUDA framework. We learned that it provides a convenient programming model for general purpose computation on NVIDIA GPUs. That model is based on data parallelism, where data is spread across many cores that are performing similar operations, and specifically the single instruction multiple thread or SIMT architecture. Compared to the SIMD programming model available on many CPUs, SIMT more easily scales to different hardware and different sizes of data. From there, we moved on to the basics of CUDA programming. We learned how to allocate and copy memory with the CUDA runtime API, how to write kernels and device functions, how to launch kernels and set their execution configurations. We also saw how to troubleshoot problems using either NVIDIA Insight or CUDA GDB and how to handle errors in our CUDA programs. We took a break from hands-on examples to learn the major concepts of the CUDA programming model. The software stack consists of a low-level driver API and a more convenient runtime API provided by the toolkit. We run code on the device by launching kernels, which are executed across blocks of threads, which are in turn arranged into a grid matching the layout of our data or algorithm. Grids can be one, two, or three-dimensional. On the hardware side, a CUDA device consists of one or more streaming multiprocessors, or SMs. These have a SIMT architecture with hardware multithreading support, which can efficiently manage thousands of threads to run our kernels. With a solid understanding of the basics, we moved on to performance optimization. Most of this section focused on efficient memory access, which is usually the most important factor in CUDA performance. We learned how to arrange our global memory reads and writes so they will coalesce, how to lay out memory for use with 2D and 3D grids, and how to make use of various caches to speed up problematic access patterns. We also learned how to maximize instruction level parallelism and use fast math functions for better arithmetic performance. While learning about performance optimization, we also covered the CUDA memory hierarchy. This consists of several layers of memory with different performance characteristics. Global memory is shared between all SMs. It's large and has a lot of bandwidth, but also high latency. So we have to manage access to global memory carefully in order to keep all SMs supplied with enough data. Global memory is backed by an L2 cache, which improves performance in some cases, but this is also shared between SMs and still has significant latency. On each SM, we also have a texture cache, which speeds up random access reads that exhibit some spatial locality, and a constant cache, allowing fast access when all threads read from the same location simultaneously. To benefit from these caches, we need to specifically declare textures or constant variables in our CUDA code. SMs also have shared memory, which is reasonably fast and can be used to pass data between threads in the same block. Finally, there are registers, which are used to store temporary values for each thread. Registers have lower latency than any other type of memory, but their size is limited and they can't be shared between threads. Next, we study some fundamental building blocks for parallel algorithms. We learned how to synchronize threads within a block and pass data between them using shared memory. And we saw how these capabilities could be combined to implement three basic algorithms, reduction, parallel prefix sum, and array filtering. In implementing these, we had to translate the theoretical algorithms to the concrete details of CUDA hardware. Within a single block, we can implement these algorithms pretty directly, but combining results across blocks is a little trickier and it generally requires a separate step or even multiple kernel launches. Reduction was the easiest algorithm. We simply reduced each block separately, synchronized, and then combined the block results in a single thread, although a more efficient implementation would use multiple threads for the second step. Prefix sum, or scan, requires more interblock communication and is harder to implement. We saw how temporary results could be stored in global memory, allowing us to launch separate kernels for each step of the process. Finally, we saw how prefix sum could be used as a building block to implement a filtering or stream compaction operation. Next, we took a brief tour of NVIDIA's many GPU accelerated libraries. For deep learning, we looked at QDNN for training, TensorRT for inference, and the DeepStream SDK for video analytics. We also talked a little bit about Tensor Cores, NVIDIA's special purpose deep learning hardware, and how to adjust settings for deep learning performance. 
For signal image and video processing, we looked at QFFT for Fourier transforms, NPP for image and signal processing primitives, and the video codec SDK. For linear algebra, we looked at QBLAS for basic linear algebra functions, QSparse for sparse matrices, and QSolver for various linear algebra solvers. For math, we looked at QRAND for random number generation and the CUDA math library for fast math functions in device code. For parallel algorithms, we looked at Thrust, a host-level API for CUDA-aware containers and accelerated algorithms, CUB for device-level algorithm building blocks, NVGraph for graph analytics, and NCCL for multi-GPU and multi-node communication. We learned how to manage concurrency in CUDA using streams. By placing independent kernels in separate streams, we can execute multiple kernels at the same time. This is a good way to improve utilization with smaller grids. By using page-locked memory, we can also perform transfers between host and device while kernels are running, and we can execute code on the host while the device is working. We saw how to synchronize streams with synchronization and event functions from the runtime API, and we learned how to spread work across multiple devices. Finally, we learned how to allocate and free heap memory from within device code, and how to launch and synchronize with child kernels from a running kernel. That concludes our review.